J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and I'm pleased to say that I have another children's author for you all today, Molly Victoria Arbutnot from Persia in Scotland in the United Kingdom. Molly has written 10 books, and they're aimed at young children, two to six, depending on the child's reading ability. These are great bedtime story books to be read either by the child themselves or a parent or a grandparent. The illustrations are simply magical. And like all children's illustrations, they are brightly colored and fun because they need to be everybody. However, for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to concentrate on two of Molly's books, Oscar the Italian Cat and Simon the Sloth. The latter of her 10th book, has just come out, everybody. Molly draws her own life experiences for inspirations to bring about these magical, adorable children's books. Each book's story is loosely based on family or friends. The books generally have an important theme, an underlying message, gently but beautifully told through the well-chosen words backed up with magical, vivid illustrations. Each book is linked to a charity which is associated with the book's theme, and part of the profits generated by the book is donated to the various designated charities she does. Molly is a teacher, author, editor, and an academic who is passionate about promoting children's literature. Molly has several degrees ranging from history of arts to children's literature from a variety of prestigious universities in the United Kingdom, like St Andrews and Cambridge University, everybody. Molly has not only taught in the UK, but has taught in Italy and Africa. And through her eight award-winning picture books, hopes to ignite the creative flame that exists in every child. And I think that's very, very important. So let's invite her onto the show to talk about what's important to her and what's important about her writing. Molly, come and join me. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. It's been a great delight. And I've looked at all your books, you know, and yes, Oscar the Italian Cat and Simon the Sloth, which we're going to talk about. They are simply magical. The, they are very simple stories, but they need to be for a child. But they're beautifully written and the uh, illustrations are brightly coloured and fun. They need to be. Molly, I understand you've written 10 books to date. Um, with Simon the Sloth being the latest. As far as I can see, you have four books in the Oscar the the Cat series and six standalone books. Now, we can't go into all of the books, everybody, because the purpose of this podcast is just to give you a flavour of what Molly's books are about. So we're going to just do Oscar the Italian Cat and Simon the Sloth, because they are the last books that she has written. Why did you choose, uh, Molly, to take Oscar and his friend Mercy on an adventure to Venice? Or should I say, a romantic adventure? I um, love Venice. I used to live in Padua, which is about 20 minutes from Venice by train. And so I used to go there quite a lot. And it's one of my spiritual homes. I have a few, but it's definitely one of them. And um, I suppose in a way, I'd always thought it would be incredibly romantic to get engaged in Venice. And so I have transferred this, uh, I hope that isn't a spoiler, um, (laughs) this delight onto the cats. Because when you look at the book, you know, the the illustrations, they are, as I said, absolutely magical. And they're beautifully coloured. And... You know, they're they're visually positive. They are uh, powerful. And because the illustrations are done by Agnes Traherne, did you enjoy working with Agnes to create these illustrations? How did you do them? How Between the two of you, how did you come up with them? Well, I'm very fortunate that I can call Agnes a friend and she has been a great friend of mine for ages. Um, And I find it's much easier working with someone who's kind of on your wavelength because it makes the collaboration much easier to do. So all 
I do really is write the story and then send it to her along with a few photographs that I'd taken of Venice because she's never been there. I was hoping we'd be able to have a collaborative work trip, but we weren't quite able to organise that. So instead I sent her the photos and I try not to interfere too much because I feel like that destroys someone's creative ideas. So I just really leave her to it and she always does an amazing job. Because the storyline really is about Oscar, the male cat, and Mercy, um, the female. And it's it's a story, everybody, of... Um, without trying to give too much away here, Molly, it's it's Oscar. Um, he's taken Mercy to on an adventure to, to Venice, a romantic venture, and he's trying to pop the question all the time to, to get her engaged, isn't he? Yeah, he is. And the the ring that he uses, you can see it, it's, it comes up all over the book, isn't it? And all the different illustrations. Was that purposely done? You know, this ring is so important, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I Well, that wasn't intentional, but um, I suppose it then works as a fun teaching tool or something that children can look out for as they're reading through the book. And as you will discover when you read the story, the ring is quite pivotal to the story now. Because when you look at, um, I've got the um, picture, I've got everything on the uh, on my iPad here, everybody. You know, you've got Oscar, um, he's in Venice. Um, you've got the pigeons who've got the ring. So the ring goes missing for a little bit. There are adventures. And he tries to propose this to Mercy on several occasions, but it doesn't always work out, does it, Molly? <laughs> no, like all the best things. <laughs> and he's, you've got the wonderful pictures. Uh, I, I love the picture of the of Venice. You've got them on the gondola. You've got the Bridge of Sighs there. You've got the lovely uh, red sun shining through the, um, you know, through the bridge there, under the bridge, on the canals there. And of course, one of the pigeons has got the ring. Hmm. Um, and Oscar gets up to all sorts of tricks, everybody. So did you enjoy writing this story? Did you enjoy creating the story? And what is the message that you're getting across to kids here? Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, talking about the, the different uh, scenes that are in the story, it's always quite difficult to decide which parts of a city or a place you kind of want to capture because... I'm limited in my story to 24 spreads. So you have to be quite selective. And so, of course, there are bits you miss out, but I have tried to give as wide a selection of different spots of Venice as possible. Um, and the whole writing process is, is really fun. I find that I get into the head of the character and imagine what they would do and where they would go and what would happen to them. And that makes the process all um, much easier to do and hopefully makes the finished product more authentic. So, I mean, I loved um, one of the scenes here. It's the, it's the party scene at Caroline's Palazzo. For, and for Oscar, he finally manages everybody to pop the question to Mercy. It's a wonderful scene. Did you enjoy creating it? Um, yes, well, it uh, it was very important for me that it was an engagement party, not a wedding party, because I was worried people would think they were jumping ahead there. And there's still a lot of adventures Oscar has to have before reaching that pinnacle. But um, yeah, it's always nice to finish each story on a celebratory happy note. And so that was the note I chose for this what's the underlying message here to kids that you're getting across with this beautiful, simple, bright, colourful story of yours? Um, I'm not sure. I guess I suppose to never give up and that if things go wrong, there's always a positive spin you can take on it. So things go wrong a bit for Oscar, but he learns from each one and doesn't make that mistake again. <laughs> That's the important message to get across. If you have a dream and you, you know, and you want to fulfill that dream, 
It doesn't always go out according to plan. That's what happened with Oscar, but you have to persist and keep going. That's the message really, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let's move on, uh, Molly, to um, Simon the Sloth. Um, why a sloth? That's what I'm interested here now. Why a sloth? Um, well, the story, there's rather a lot of inspiration for that one. Um, I uh, was on holiday in the Outer Hebrides and chatting with a friend of ours, and he plays the bagpipes. And we were thinking how funny it would be if a very slow animal tried to play the bagpipes and naturally thought of slow. And I am drawn to them because the first play I saw in my prep school um, before I started there was Yane Mamo and a very good friend of mine was acting the sloth and I sat at the back and never forgotten it. And so they're an important animal to me in lots of ways. I wondered where the, you know, when you look at the cover, everybody, yes, you've got Simon the Sloth there. And of course, he's playing the bagpipes. And of course, this is the whole story. He's playing the bagpipes all over the place, um, in, you know, throughout parts of the world. Um, I, you know, I, I just thought, uh, Molly, as you know, a sloth um, with an affinity to play in the bagpipes is very unique. Clearly, the bagpipes are a nod to your Scottish heritage. But why did you choose a sloth? Um, as you said, you talk about this sluggish uh, character. Do you think kids are going to enjoy Simon the Sloth? Well, I hope so. I've got the front cover here, actually, so I can show you there he is. Yay, there you go, everybody. <laughs> um, I Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's unique and different, and everyone loves a a sloth or sloth I should maybe say I'm trying to start a revival of sloth because um I know that lots of my generation say sloth my parents generation say sloth maybe it's old-fashioned of me but you have a slothful person and it always used to be sloth so I'm trying to um <laughs> send it back and David Attenborough says sloth so I feel like it has valid justification <laughs> ah. Um, I'm fascinated as to where you came up with the idea of where you put uh, the character Simon the Sloth, you know, what, you know, throughout different parts of the world. I mean, you take Simon to the desert, you know, um, underwater, to Mount Everest, to the Taj Mahal, and after a bit of amber nectar, he becomes an overnight sensation, and you have him playing on the famous pyramid stage, which I can only assume is Glastonbury City. Glastonbury. Why these sites? Have you been to these places? Is that's what's made you put the characters there? I try to make every book a educative tool and so pick um, as many sort of polar opposite locations as possible because then with each one you can look at the animals that are in it and um you when you're reading it to a class you can in a way teach them the animals that are there um and so I haven't been to any of these places my brother my brothers have been to India to the Taj Mahal but um I haven't I haven't actually and I haven't been to Mount Everest or the jungle or underwater but it's trying to uh yeah teach the children um what these different places would be and to make them as varied as possible to make it an interesting book. Well, let me tell you something. I've been to Mount Everest and I saw that picture and I, I could, it resonated with me. I've seen the Taj Mahal, I've been to the Amazon and where, and to Glastonbury. So where you have put all these, you know, the storyline for Simon the Sloth, I um, can recollect those scenes and I thought, that's why I was going to, why is she particularly going to put them there? Because there's a message again in this book, isn't there? What is the message you're getting across here? Um, well, the, the main message behind it is that sometimes all you need is right under your nose and you can travel to places, you can have experiences 
that sometimes the one thing you actually need is always just there in front of you. Um, and I suppose as well, there's sort of to generate a sense of adventure and fun and that it's important to travel and see new places too. I think it's very important for children to travel, you know, when they've, you know, in their adulthood to go and see the world and to see all the different cultures and different societies and to respect those different cultures and societies and different faiths. That's very, very important. So, yes, I think what the choices that you made to where you put Simon the Sloth is brilliant and well chosen. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly resonated with me quite a bit. And Maud Smith's beautiful illustrations they're bright again they're colorful um i love the one that she did where he's um she's got simon the slow underwater and he's got his yellow flippers you've got the pink octopus you've got the um red um different types of fishes and you know the uh, claw crabs it's it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. think a child could spend hours just looking at the, um, the pictures and getting so much out of them. Oh, good. This I've bit got... says, because yes. you put him here, he's tried playing in the deep Atlantic Ocean. That's it. Yes. Um, going back to the message, I suppose the message as well is to do what you love because it finishes um, with showing these different characters doing what they love and that um, that sometimes can make one very happy. Oh, yes. I mean, you've got, you know, Simon in the middle of the um, Sahara Desert, you know, with the camels in the background. That's great. You know, he's in a blue um, outfit with playing these bagpipes in the middle of the um, Sahara Desert, everybody. And you've got... Um, and the jungle, you know, we've got tigers, you've got elephants, you've got a whole vast array, array of animals, you know, and gorillas. You know, it's just eye-catching, everybody. It really is. Even the one where you've got him climbing up Mount Everest in a red outfit with his bagpipes on his back and he's got an ice hook and the snow leopard is looking at him going, and what are you doing up here? <laughs> It's a beautiful book, um, everybody, for kids to thoroughly enjoy. Um, I'm intrigued as to, you know, the tribute to um, Uncle Simon at the end about keeping traditions alive. What's that about? Obviously, that's where the name Simon's come from, I take it. Um, yes, it is. I Well, my dad was one of eight so there were a lot of siblings and uncle simon was a headmaster of a prep school um in uh worcestershire and he was very into family and traditions and um so it really is just a tribute to him i think it's a wonderful tribute <laughs> i really do um do you love writing uh, for young kids and creating this these highly imaginative books? These, this is your dream, isn't it? This is what you want to do. This is your passion. This is your drive, isn't it? Um, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I don't necessarily write for young kids. I think a good story is one that can be enjoyed by any age. But I really enjoy what I do, and um, I find... I have actually switched off a bit over Christmas <laughs> because um, the thing is with writing books or doing anything that is your own job, you kind of can never switch off from it. So my brain's always coming up with ideas or thoughts. And I find that that's a good, it used to be how I kind of made sense of the world. Um, I'm not sure it is so, so much now, but it, it kind of keeps me, it keeps me inquisitive and looking at the world with an objective eye. Yeah, and towards the end of the book, you say, join Simon on his musical quest and maybe you'll find your spiritual song too. Can you just enlighten us a little bit here? Why you put those two lines in? 
Uh, well, Simon does go on a quest around the world to try to, does. in his way, to try to speed up his bagpipe playing. Um, and I know that a lot of people, hope, well, possibly can relate to that in traveling around the world, searching, not necessarily for speeding up your bagpipe playing, but searching for whatever's important to them. And so it's kind of to give support or uh, um, reassurance to people who are. You've got at the end of the book a little symbol, and uh, it's the Sloth Conservation Foundation. Uh, yes, yeah, Sloco. Um, that's it. That's uh, the um, uh, charity that I work with for that book. With the Italian cat, I'm working with We Are Here Venice, um, run by Jane DeMosso, and I work with Sloco for Simon the Sloth. Sloth. <laughs> I feel it's um, important to try to support a charity. So I, I can't support them financially massively, but I try as much as I can, and I feel that it's good awareness having the logo on the back of the book too so they can go and have a look at that and yes, get, a, exactly. get, a, get a bit more of a taste and see what's you know what's happening around the world with uh sloths yeah what's next for you molly in both in terms of your own life and that of your writing are there any books in the pipeline um there are always a few books i'm working on two for this year well next year um, one is going to be launched on the 23rd of June in London and the next one in Edinburgh in December. Um, and I haven't decided what the second one's going to be, but the first one to be launching is about the Q Steam Museum um, and a cat called Bolton who lives there, actually lives there. Um, it's an amazing building. And my mum had a friend who was an artist there he sadly died, but, and so this is really a tribute to him and to the amazing building that this Houston is in. Ah, there you go, everyone. <laughs> um, who do you see, Molly, as your market for your book, your books? Uh, but more importantly, who would you like to see reading your books? You know, young children, mature folk, people of all ages? Um, people of all ages ideally i feel that it's a great um stigma against our society that you feel that a picture book is only for young children and that when you progress with your reading you can move on to chapter books it's it's what we used to teach at the school i worked at that you have this sort of natural progression and if your child's still on picture books, you're very worried that they're not progressing as they should. But I don't feel that that's the case. And I feel that picture books can teach all ages um, a lot and that there's nothing that makes a book less because it has pictures as well. I think that really it makes it more. Where can people get your books from? Um, from my website, and Amazon, I've just launched onto uh, Amazon so that it opens up doors all over the world and KDP, so Kindle Direct Publishing um, as well. And then there's an audio book for each story that's on Audible that you can download as well, read by my cousin Huey, who's really good. There you go, everyone. I have to say, uh, Molly, I've thoroughly enjoyed, you know, looking at your books, um, looking at the very vivacious, vivid, bright illustrations, the and just getting a little feeling for what the little storylines are behind these. And I'm going to use this word very kindly, simple, effective, but imaginative stories, both Oscar and Simon. Oscar the Cat, who's got another got to other books um, you've written about him. And of course, Simon is the, the first book that you're writing about Sloth. Whether you write any more, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? <laughs> yeah. But I just want to thank you for coming on and 
given us the uh, an insight into both what you and your books are about. So I would like just like to say, Molly Arbuther, thank you very much. Thank you, John. It's been great. Molly Arbuther, everybody. Well, as I say every week, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. So until next time, stay safe.